Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Moore Fillmore, and I am the interim CEO and director at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. And while it was very chilly, a little freezing rainy, I did feel a little of Maud's tulips kind of pushing through. And I feel like today we're going to get uh, exactly what we need to whet our appetites for the spring that is almost in the air. So on behalf of all of us at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia and the Halifax Public Library, welcome. Bienvenue, Jalassi. The Art Gallery of Nova Scotia and the Halifax Central Library both stand on Mi'kmaq, the Mi'kmaq territory, and support art, culture, and education on this land. We strive for meaningful partnerships with all the people of this province as we continue to live and learn in Halifax. We also recognize the 400 year plus year history of communities of African descent and the 50 um, African Canadian Nova Scotian communities throughout the region today. So both the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia and our hosts today, the Halifax Public Libraries, are community gathering places. We invite people to participate, and at the Art Gallery, our team is working very hard to connect people with art. Today is an opportunity to do just that, connect with art and with people like you, curious people, people who like to learn, and people who like to consider how things came to be. And thank you for being there. I'm still not loud enough, which is so ironic, because. You can't imagine how loud I really am. So loud. Um, I am so pleased we were able to bring this presentation and panel discussion about the conservation of Maud Lewis's painted house and artwork to you today. This is a topic that our team gets asked about all the time. And I see many of our docent guides and, um, and, and friends in the fam and family in the audience. And I know that you hear this on every tour, every time we walk through the gallery and introduce people to that special magical house. People ask, wait a minute, is this the real house? Like the real house? Did she really live here? We say, yes, but not like right here, but yes, here. And how did you get this house into an art gallery? Well, how amazing that we are here today with the actual people who made this happen. So I am thrilled to be welcoming panelists Craig Dix, Jennifer Fotheringham, and Michelle Gallinger. And I'd also like to mention that Craig and Jennifer worked under the spectacular Laurie Hamilton, who was senior conservator at the AGNS at the time. She was instrumental in the conservation work that they will be talking about today. And I maybe saw Laurie sneak in incognito without ever wanting anyone to know she's here, but I saw you and I miss you. And so I'm saying hello and thank you for being here. So I'd also like to acknowledge the significant and ongoing support from the province of Nova Scotia and the Canada Council for the Arts. And I'd also like to, of course, thank our wonderful hosts, the Halifax Public Libraries, for this fantastic partnership. And if you haven't already been to the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia to experience both the nationally traveling Maud Lewis exhibition, which is on view until April 23rd, and the Scotiabank Maud Lewis Gallery, which is home to the Maud Lewis Painted House, please come. Every Thursday is BMO free access night, which means it's free or you can pay what you would like. And we have programs for all ages and interests that are happening at the gallery, including a wealth of community projects, paint nights, health and wellness, health and wellness initiatives, artist talks, and panel discussions like today. We did have quite a well-attended pint and paint night focused on Maud Lewis because nothing goes better with Maud than a cool pint. You can check out our website, agns.ca, for all of our upcoming programs and exhibitions. And I hope to see you at the gallery soon. I would like to just uh, 
introduce my colleague before we get into too much of the actual discussion. My colleague Shannon Parker was raised in the Annapolis Valley and she returned to Nova Scotia in 2006 to join the staff at the AGNS and has managed our collection department ever since. She worked at the National Museum of the American Indian and the Indian Art Research Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where she worked for six years. And at the AGNS, Shannon manages the care and handling and feeding of all of the artwork that comes through our doors and leaves. And most recently, she has been involved in the rehang of the Scotiabank Maud Lewis Gallery. Maud Lewis, her house, her art, and her legacy as well as the audio tour that you can hear when you come through to visit. And while the audio tour is great, the live humans that animate are even better. So please come while we have a tour and visit us. So we have a little joke and it's a pun. And so if we had a closed caption, it would be even funnier. But it's a welcome to our moderator, M-A-U-D, it's a, it's a groaner, kids, but it's good, okay? <laughs> Thank you. To our moderator, Shannon Parker, our law for curator of collections. I can talk loud, no worries. It's my pleasure to bring these three people together to talk to you today about the conservation of Maud's house and her artwork. As someone who grew up in the Annapolis Valley, not far from where Maud lived, um, passing by a rather decrepit looking little house as a kid, I'm wondering, oh, it's cute and it's painted and it's small, um, never imagining how much of effect and how much I would learn about this house as an adult and then taking care of this house for going on two decades. Um, a large part of this discussion was not just because we were planning programming related to the Mod Touring exhibition, but because in the planning for a new art gallery, Craig and I, in particular, were having a lot of discussions about how the house originally was moved, restored, and installed in the existing gallery, and how it would look to then deinstall it and move it and reinstall it again. So we realized that there's so much information in the archives that this was a great time to bring together the people who actually made this happen almost 30 years ago, which is incredible. So it's my great pleasure to start with Craig. Craig Dix is a generalist conservator specializing in furniture. Trained at the Canadian Conservation Institute in Ottawa, he worked as the department head for the conservation department for the Manitoba Museum. In 1992, Craig moved to Nova Scotia and created a co private conservation practice. Projects included work with the Alexander Graham Bell Museum, preservation of the Mastodon from Milford, Nova Scotia, collection storage inventory and design, as well as furniture preservation for the general public. In 1994, he was tasked with moving his largest artifact, the Maud Lewis Painted House, into the then newly renovated Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, where it's permanently housed. Now, before I turn this over, this is just a reminder, we are recording this. Uh, when we get to the Q&As, you'll find that I will uh, reiterate all any questions that come up so that we have that recorded as well, but just be aware of that. And now, please join me in welcoming Craig Dix. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure that many of you have probably visited the Maud Lewis House at the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. What you witnessed there was the result of many years of planning and hard work, beginning with its rescue from Marshalltown. I first saw the house in an airplane hangar in Waverly in 1994, and I wanted to just show you Sorry, I'm going to do that automatically. I can see it out here. But show you just a couple of pictures I took in 1994 before any of the work had begun. And I, there we go, sorry. And it was uh, nestled in amongst a bunch of other things, as you can see, but and, uh, in, in limbo, really, at this point, because uh, 
Bernie Reardon had contacted me, Bernie Reardon being the director of the, music, of the art gallery at the time, and wanted to go ahead with this project, but it was in its early stages and we were, just, uh, we were discussing what possibilities there were. And here's another picture of, that shows you, although this isn't an ideal situation where it is, at least it's in out of the weather because it had been, um, I'll say abandoned, Thank you, I'm sorry, I'm gonna end up doing this probably the whole time. I should, yes, I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. And then you can see. Yeah, yeah. Just, you can just hold these, okay. Okay, or yeah, you can even okay. Like this, like Stick with my day job, okay. Yeah. All right, that's great, I'm sorry about that. All right, well. Uh, yeah, that even though this isn't ideal, at least it's indoors out of the weather because it had been abandoned for a number of years after Everett died. And uh, you can see the paint is flaking off of it and it's um, in need of a little bit of help. Um, you can see damage that was uh, caused. I don't know if that was from the move or whether that was in, in uh, situ, but there's roof damage that had to be uh, dealt with. And Although my next photo that I'd like to show you didn't happen until much later, I wanted to, to show you how our goal was to maintain as much of the original material of the house as possible. Now, uh, this is a close-up of a corner board, as they call them, along the edge. I don't know which corner of the house. It's probably the front. But as you can see, the weather has rotted the bottom part of it. and Although it would have been just as easy or even easier to just remove them and put all new pieces of wood in there, our goal was to remain, uh, was to, to maintain, I'm sorry, maintain as much of the original, po uh, the <laughs> sorry, <laughs> maintain as much of the original material as possible. And so this was how we uh, approached that problem, by just replacing areas that were damaged and then in painting them so that they looked like they'd always been there. This, of course, is not the same corner as the other one. We aren't magicians. This is a, a little bit better shape and, and a different corner, but you get the idea. Inside, this is a picture that I took then of Maud's original stove, which, um, when we examined it, was way beyond help. I mean, it had, it had rusted out completely, pretty much. And in the end, the one that you see in the display at the gallery is a new one or a sort of a composite perhaps of some of the old parts that were salvageable and some of the new parts that look like the original. Okay, sorry. This is upstairs, a place where most people don't get to go. It's, it's quite small up there and the only place you can really stand up is right in the center because of the the gabled ends. This is a cot, folding cot, perhaps one that Everett slept on, um, but it was uh, in rough condition as well. And I just wanted to include these two, although I'm not going to talk about the wallpaper. I wanted to just show you the terrible condition that it was in when I saw it in 1994. Um, due to the weather and, and neglect after many, many years. Jennifer will go into much more detail about the interesting process of its conservation, but uh, this is just sort of a taste of uh, what, uh, how it had gone downhill over the years. Like that one and there. Now some of you may have noticed in my first photo that the door to the house was different than the one that you see there now. Now, my understanding is that Everett sold the original door and then perhaps built this one, but painted it himself because he needed a, a storm door. And it isn't quite as glorious as the one we have, but fortunately, the art gallery was able to find the original door, except that it had been cut off on the top and the bottom for display by the owners in, in their home or where they were displaying it, so part of it was missing. 
So using photographs of the original, I was able to replicate the missing pieces of wood at the top and the bottom to get it back to the proper scale again. And then what I had to do was distress and paint the, the new wood to blend in with the original. Now when I say distressed, that means to make the word wood look as worn as a door that had been on there for 20 or 30 years and uh, out to the weather. And I do remember that that included the liberal use of a wire brush because the, the, the original door is a little bit rough in spots. But hopefully it blends in well enough that most people don't, don't see the difference. And I think we're very lucky to have been able to return this colorful and unique piece to uh, the house that welcomes us into her home. Sorry, that didn't work out. Anyway, let's, let's talk about the dismantling of the house now. So, the first thing we needed to do was, um, I'm sorry, although it had arrived in the storage hangar in one piece, it was necessary to disassemble it to, to be able to get it into its new space at the art gallery. Our job was to take it apart and restore it to the condition that it had been when Maud lived in it. The dark line, here's where I get to use the laser pointer, I've been waiting for this, I love this. Here. Anyway, the dark line that you see, I'm sorry, the dark line you see across here is a row of shingles that have been removed so that we were able to cut the roof along the horizontal into two more manageable pieces. And as you can see, it's being lowered down to the ground. Um, the top section, yeah, okay. Here's another shot. Oh, I'm too many places to check. On the back side, and I put this one in because it gives you a better view of the ramp system that the, uh, the team built to be able to lower them carefully to the ground. And then finally, the bottom one. So now we have the entire roof off. And um, from there, we had to take off the gable ends, they being the, the pointed ends at the air, and they were taken off the exact same way by shingle removal and then cut off. And we were left with the main part of the house and the, and the second floor, the, well, ceiling floor. Now this shot from above, I'll just try and orient you. We've got, now I can use this again. This is the back side of the house. This opening here is where the stairs come up. And this is the area in the kitchen where the stovepipe would have come through, just so you have an idea of what direction the house is, is in. But as you can see, there's many, many different types of, of boards there of all different shapes and sizes. And it was important that they all go back to their original position. So each board was numbered and a floor plan created so that we could, we could make that so. All right, what have we got next? And now that we have the floor removed, um, the idea we will, whoa, I'm sorry, I've lost my spot here. Hmm. I'm sorry, I'm very sorry about that. With the floorboards removed, we began to dismantle the structure that supported the plaster and lath ceiling, which you can see has already been removed, and all that's left is just the strapping and the, uh, the support beams, that, which uh, would never pass code today, that's for sure. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> unbelievable. Um, an interesting thing about the, that I found about the house, when just because we have it torn apart here at this place, is how much of the house, I think, was rebuilt using wood from other houses and sheds and what have you, and, um, and then moved to their site where they, where they lived in this thing. Because as we took it apart, we found uh, mortise and tenon joints that went nowhere and, and corners that looked like they obviously, or corner posts and things that looked like they should have actually been going you know, in other directions. So it was a hodgepodge of reused and recycled wood, so I guess perhaps uh, Everett was a little ahead of his time there. All right, so next, left with the main floor. All right, so uh, now I'm good, now I'm good. The walls were then were all cut, cut apart and 
a thick plastic sheeting was, was um, screwed on from both sides to protect the shingles on the outside and to try and protect what was left of the plaster on the inside wall. And I wanted to include this picture as well because you can see it's a great picture of the uh, system that was put together by the team. <coughs> Excuse me. They uh, had to weld these little, little frames here that have wheels on the bottom just to be able to move these things because they weighed so much. So each wall and each gable end, and I think there's, what, the 10 pieces. So we had to end up making 20 of these things just to be able to move things uh, into town. Here, the, the fellows have got it loaded up onto a trailer, and it's on its way to the Sunnyside Mall in Bedford. Now, this is a spot where I was going to ask, is there anybody, just for fun, is there anyone here that went to Bedford to see, is there a hand in the, no hands in the air or anything like that, that saw it at, at Sunnyside? And the, oh my goodness. One. It was where the old Zellers used to be, depending on how big a Zellers person you were, I guess. <laughs> and Zellers is coming back, but Maud's not going back there, I can tell you that for free. So, uh, yeah, and we had, we had a, a huge space, which we just used a small portion of, but it was very convenient for us to put that there so that the public could come and take a look at it. And here's just a, a picture of the, the fellows taking it out into the, uh, the space at the, the old Zellers. Sorry, I don't know if that's a hard word. You've got to spell every time. I won't, I'll stop saying Zellers. <laughs> um, one of, uh, yeah, Jennifer and I spent um, time at the mall speaking with people and um, giving them a chance to see the project in progress because there had been articles in the paper and on television about what was going on, but they really couldn't see, see that uh, in Waverly. Many of them had their own stories about Maud they wanted to tell, how they'd been to her house and bought paintings and, you know, heard of her and all this, and, and it was a kind of a trip down memory lane for a few, a few people. And we did, we heard some quite interesting stories. It was also a great opportunity for media coverage for the art gallery and to create interest in the upcoming gallery that they were renovating. So here we are in the new gallery where, where it is at the moment. And as you can see, the fellows are using what's called a drywall lift. And uh, here's, here's, an, here's a, uh, a tidbit that I, I, don't, I, haven't, I haven't mentioned before, I guess, was we got there and we, we thought, how are we going to get this thing back together again? Because the space is so small, we can't build ramps the way we had and slide it all back up. Because if you've seen the Maude Lewis house, you know there's only about, I don't know, four feet behind it, so it was physically impossible. Fortunately, they were renovating the gallery, and these drywall lifts, which are used for huge sheets of heavy drywall that the, the other fellows were uh, working with, um, said, yeah, try one of these. And we were able to put the walls and the, and the roof pieces onto that and get them up into place and then uh, rebuild it that way which was incredibly fortunate. All right. Um, yeah, and I wanted to mention that you can see the plaster was removed because in spite of our best efforts of putting the plastic on and um, being as careful as we could, the plaster was uh, in bad shape to start and we lost, we, it was just was unsalvageable. This picture is just in here and it doesn't, doesn't quite show up, but you, this is when the house has been put back together and the only thing's missing is right along the top there you can see a piece of the roof is missing, but um, sort of an in-progress picture there. What's more, this is one that, I'm sorry, this is one you probably haven't seen. We have the, we have the house in there now, it has to be sort of rebuilt again from the inside. <clears throat> and this uh, gentleman, Manny McPherson, was one of the few people we could find that was still do plaster and lath work because everyone uses drywall for renovations like that. And to find somebody that actually knew how to do it was incredibly difficult 25 years ago. So for those of you, I'll just very quickly, who don't know what uh, plaster and lath is, the, the lathing is the pieces of wood that are, that are nailed onto the, to the walls. And 
what's done is that you can see he's putting on what's called a scratch coat of the really heavy duty plaster that goes through those, those uh, spaces in between the lath and as it squeezes out it forms what's called a key and when it dries that's what holds the plaster to the lath and then you put on a, a nice finished coat of plaster over that to, to make it look nice. But uh, it's quite a job. We were very fortunate to find him. One of the considerations we realized as he was doing this was that the job that it was, had been done on the interior of the house was not a particularly good one to start with. So he couldn't actually do as good a job as he wanted to. He had to make it kind of look like an amateur job so that it looked like Maude Lewis's house and not the interior of, you know, your own home because you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to quite, you know. He, he, he was very, uh, very helpful. All right, and then once that was dry, I just looked at him. Almost done here. We've got once, once that was dry, the ceiling and the walls, of course, were painted with colors that were matched the original. Samples had been taken before we started pulling, uh, pulling the house apart, and Lori Hamilton had some of those. And uh, she and, and her people did, I mean, and the gallery staff and whatever did the painting. We didn't do that. But uh, at that point, really, the house was back and ready for the next stage uh, for people like Jennifer and for Lori, the fine arts conservator at the AGNS, and the gallery staff to fill it with the magic of Maude Lewis again. And I think that that's where uh, Jennifer is going to talk about some of the things that you see in there um, at the moment, or, uh, sorry, at the present, I should say. One last thing I just wanted to say before I go is that uh, I want to take this opportunity to say that the Maude experience is one of the favorite projects of my career for two reasons. The first, of course, was learning more about a treasured Nova Scotian artist and helping to preserve her legacy. The second was that when I offered to take on this project, I knew I was going to need a special team to make it a success. One with a strong background in areas like carpentry and welding and trades, but also they needed to be problem solvers and they needed to have a sensitivity to conservation. And I found that team in these three highly skilled and imaginative team members. Kim Jarrett, Steve Shannon, and Todd Vassallo. And I'd like to give them my sincere thanks. Thank you very much. I'll just do this. <laughs> Here, I'll do this. Ooh. Thank you, Craig. That was fantastic. That gives us the bare bones of the house. And coming up next is Jennifer Fotheringham, who's going to tell us how the house materials and objects and walls came to life. So give you a little bit of background on Jennifer. She's worked in the conservation labs of various art galleries in Canada and has taught restoration and conservation at university in London, England. She returned home to Halifax to raise a family and continue private practice where she treats paintings of all types. Most recently, Jennifer has been working on a restoration of the painted murals of St. Mary's Cathedral Basilica in Halifax. She has a silver standard poodle named Russell who assists with most jobs. With this, please welcome Jennifer Fotheringham. Thank you, Shannon, for that very nice introduction. I wasn't sure if she'd put in the part about Russell, but he's become pretty popular. <laughs> anyway, when I was initially contacted to do this job, I was intimidated. And if I thought about it too long, well, I might have done it. So I didn't. I just immediately dropped what I was doing and did a switcheroo 
and came straight back to Halifax because at the time, I was very young. It was a long time ago and I was new in my career. I was only a couple years into work and at the time, we were in a deep recession. There was not a lot of work and you were very lucky to be able to have any type of job, a paying job, and one that you could keep on doing. So when Lori called me, oh, it, I, I, it took less than a minute, and I did an immediate switcheroo and stopped what I was doing in Toronto working. I was happy working there, and I didn't think I'd ever get to come home. But, in the near future at that time. And that phone call changed everything. And similar to Craig, I think that it was the greatest restoration experience of my life because it allowed me to come home, to continue to work and live here, to do something I loved, and to be part of the most special team of people. Uh, I, I'm a type of person that I need to be directed, and Lori Hamilton, the head conservator at the time, directed me it, all through all the different things I took on. And it was daunting, but it was really fun, and I cared a lot about it. And I cared more and more as the job went on. It kind of grabbed a hold of your heart. So we, even though I worked in one space, Lori worked in another, sometimes I was at Sunnyside Mall, the objects I did at home, and I spent lots of time at the gallery, I was not alone. I had a great leader. And, and then I also had Judy Dietz, the head curator at the time. So between her and Lori and then Craig, and his sense of humor, and all the fun we had at Sunnyside Mall, it became the greatest project ever. And I had no idea of what I, I had become a part of. It took about 10 months, my part. I was thinking back, how, how many months did I work on that? I did other things at the time, but that was my focus, on and off for 10 months. I would do something, bring it back to Lori, you know, we'd alter it, then I'd bring it back home. So it, it was the better part of 10 months. All right, let's get the clicker, and I will, whoop, right here. yep, here, here we go. go. I will click, and we can look at some pictures. Okay. All right. So, this you may have seen before. This is something I didn't see, but uh, obviously, but this is, this is a photo of how it was. And we referred to this photo a lot because things weren't in too bad a condition at this time. You can see Everett cooking and Maude at the back. In recent, like more recent photos of her work, it seemed that she worked by the window. So, but in this photo, she's at the back working. And then this is the next vision of it. Now, this I didn't see, but certainly Lori and Craig. Craig, I don't know if you did see that. No, you didn't see that. So, so Lori must have. This I didn't see either. But when I started to see what, what was presented, this, I had never restored anything like this. I was going to use all the same skills for different painted surfaces on different substrates, but there, nothing like this had ever come my way. Yep, there we go, there we go. So, here is the first photo of the wallpaper on the wall before we took it off. And the taking off of wallpaper like this was not unlike how, if any of you have taken off wallpaper before, it's not very easy, and without destroying what's underneath. So the process involved humidification, introducing water and moisture to lift up the paste that had been used to put it on, 
and taking it off in as big of fragments as possible without creating any more tears. That's a picture of it, what we had off, and it had been flattened. So if I go back, go back one, flattened, flattened, made, made flat again. And that with paper, and it's the same sort of thing on different works of art on paper, if they're curled up or buckled and they have bumps and bulges in them, you can you know, quite simply flatten them with the use of humidity and pressure, sort of interleaving layers of blotting paper so that you're never wetting the, the paper itself. You're always just introducing the humidity, not, not the liquid water. So that, that's what happened there. We got it flattened and put back on. Yeah. Yeah, now I'm going to use a clicker. I can look here. Yeah. So right here, here is it back in place in the art gallery. And there's a couple things you can see that are different and that we decided that, you know, there was no need of them being there. They might have been later Everett additions on his own because see this piece of flowery cloth stuck up? Well, underneath you had these images and you had these and also, hold on, let me think here. Yeah, flowers, flowers. The little house up here was a decal that wasn't something she had painted. So that was gone, so we didn't reconstruct that. But everything else, you can sort of match your eye back and forth. You can follow here to here, you know, uh, down through here over to here, the little, it, it was, it was a, this is a good, there was two walls of pattern, but this wall was the best wall because it showed that it, it had no order to it. It was swirling, whirling, kind of almost upside down in a way at times, like the, the butterflies flying, you know, all of a sudden you've got a little, a little deer and you've got a racing horse and then you've got a horse in the woods. I mean, it was wonderful. The look of it, it you couldn't really believe it in the house. Let's go ahead. This, this is how Lori, when I would get things flattened, then we would work on a board and, oh, I'm sorry, go back. I would get things flattened and then she drew this. She would put in what we needed to get back, where we needed to piece our pieces back. So we worked in chunks. And whenever something was missing, and really missing, we would recreate it using you know, dry pigments, reversible mediums. Conservators use those things all the time. We never use materials that can't be undone. We never use materials that are going to change over time and become irreversible. And most of all, we never paint over original paint. And so that is the, that's the tricky part with a lot of the mod the materials in the house is that the, the edges were jagged. So you needed to be we were very delicate and detailed, trying to work along the borders and make sure we never touched original. We only, you only fill in where it's lost. Don't take any liberties. Yeah, so there's some details. She had such detail in some of her things, you know. Some of her other things are more crude. I, you know, as she grew older and, and it was more difficult for her too, but that little deer is good. And then there's the, the horseback rider, in sort of racing. Now this is the other wall, yeah. And so that gives you another view of what it looked like. Overwhelming, okay. 
and look, done. <laughs> Let's go back again. It's so fun. <laughs> okay, look, there. Look, there. <laughs> it's great. Um, let's see. Okay, there's little parts in here I'm going to talk about. That just, it's fun to just see one of those. Here's another. Yeah, there's before. Look at it. There's all kinds of things spilled and poured down the surface. That's yeah, really bad. And there's after. So that whole back wall is, you know, and a collection of things that I worked on. See that little cot? You can see the little cot right here. That, we always thought, was where Maud slept when she couldn't get upstairs, when it became too difficult. Okay. Uh, let's go to the bread box. Okay. So we'll go back and look at the bread box. You can see them there. She liked all of those. And that, since there were no cupboards, that, that was probably the food storage area. Let's go ahead. Okay, so the first thing with the metal was that I had to reshape it. And a lot of you probably know things about metal. There's something you can do to metal called annealing. And it, it's a process of heating it. And when you heat it past its, its recrystallization point, it becomes ductile, so you can bend it. So this, the strategy here was to heat it enough that I could, using pressure, bring it back into shape, but I couldn't heat it so much I bubbled the paint off of it. So it, it was sort of like, a, all the restorations are like surgeries, really. Like you do one thing, but you can't cause harm to another thing. So th that was the first thing, to clean it, obviously, with you know, dry brushes, mechanical, and then, then to get it cleaned as much as possible and then get it back into shape. Let's go. That's another view. Yeah, really bad. And there it is, back in shape. And then the next process was, now I am going to talk about the rust on another slide, but yes, rust was stabilized so that it will not rust anymore. And then retouches were done. You, know, you can see where they would have been all along here, all along here, all along the top. Now let's go to the next. There, done. Yeah, and, and, and not done to look perfect, you know, because it had to look right. It, everything, like Craig said, the sensitivity to how it was, you know, not adding paint on top of Maud's things, you know. Okay, let's go to another. There's another. That one wasn't, that one wasn't so challenging. It, it was still square. It was more of a cleaning exercise and retouching and stabilizing what rust was there. Okay, there that is. Okay, don't want to go too fast. I'm hopping around a little bit just because we're still on that back wall. And th this, you, I don't know if it caught your eye before, but that is a unique piece. It's painted on a piece of linoleum that she had stuck to the wall. And it had a lot of detail in it, and it was modern and bold. It, it was like a freestanding piece that she did on her own. Let's see. And you can see it was all, it looked like it had been heated. The paint was bubbled up. Um, most of it was flaking off. It was not stable at all. But it had to be saved. It, it looked, we could save it, uh, for sure. So there it is done. And so we got the, the, all the nice little checkerboard patterns. She had a really nice little modern touch with her, her patterns on the bases of the plant pot she painted. They were often di like diamond shapes. And then she created her wicker with this. 
Yeah, and that was not unlike a painting restoration you would do on canvas. The idea was that you had to stop the flaking, you had to halt the deterioration, and then retouch in the losses to bring it, reintegrate it to a certain point. Not, not to look new, but just to bring the design together. So we'll go forward. There we go. And now we can skip back to metal again. Again, this is a unique piece because it was a cookie or it may be a tea canister and it has these black designs, the checkerboard design on the back. So she knew how to kind of frame things. Anyway, that you can see closely that the rust had eaten away from the top. And the thing about rust is that there's lots of rust removal products out there. You can buy them in Canadian Tire. But most of them, what they do is that they, they do remove the rust, but they make more rust in the process. So for a conservator, treating rust is, we can, we can remove a bit of rust, but we don't want to remove a lot of paint any paint, but we want to stabilize the rust. So the treatment used for that is phosphoric acid, sometimes tannic acid. But the, what, what happens is that you remove the mechanical part and then you use the acid to reform the rust into a stable product. So it's iron, it's, it's an unstable iron oxide with water as rust, and then you, you reform it to be a stable form of iron oxide. And then on top of that, we could use synthetic resins and dry pigments to retouch and to pull the design back together. This is a neat thing. This doesn't look like normal mod, does it? It's, it's a Again, like so many of her things on her walls, I think they came from things she saw, things she imagined, but a combination. Anyway, I always wondered if she had seen a pirate-looking ship, something ominous. But it was unique, and we, it, we needed to save it. It was special. And it had her detail, the signature detail in the in the details of the boat. Let me show you, there. So you can see, you, you know, she, she did the little ladders and it sort of had a nice little curvature to it. That was on a piece of oil cloth. Again, a lot of the things Maud painted on, apart from the boards that Everett made or were given to her, she used items that were given to her. So I don't know where the oil cloth would have come along, but you know, she, she viewed it as a type of canvas and she, she, it was pinned to the wall. So there it is, relaxed, flat. You know, there wasn't, I don't think there was much reintegrating there needed at all. It was just a humid, really a humidification process. Another oil cloth. Again, a different style than what she painted with other things, like a little bit abstract with the rainbow pattern all along the bottom. Yeah. And they were very dark. They were coated with an oil. I never, we, we, Lori and I, we weren't sure whether it was something that maybe Everett brushed on later. We didn't know. What the coating was was dark yellow. So when we got these things cleaned, you know, they, they ended up, they're still dirty looking, but they're clean. Yeah. That's a good one. It's by the, now that you see these, you'll, you'll recognize them again. Okay, I'll end on the stairs. That, that, this is my last slide. And the stairs were kind of a funny thing because, yeah, you can see in this photo. Well, two things about the stairs. They're uniform. The same thing, every step. And I, I don't know that you can see that that well looking in the house, but they're the same. Each one of the, the plants on the side has the three petals on each side. They each have the, the same floral design. 
And see, Maud's walls were not all the same. Everything on those walls was swirling all around and nothing repeated, really, apart from flowers. So I don't know about these. We had a lot of discussion about them. Were they something that she did later? Because they're, they're quite, they're not detailed, but they would have been very hard for her to paint. She, that would have been very difficult to get into that position to do that. And they make sense in a way when you think about that Maud did a lot of repeats. She made many kitties, many oxen. So it makes sense that she would make many flowers. It's just that I'm quite surprised she didn't do every step something different. You know, that part was always a little unusual. One thing you can see are the cracks, and those cracks, those were not unstable. That was a type of drying crack you've probably all seen on painted things before. And it's called, some people call it alligatoring, but it happens when one layer below dries faster than the layer on the top, and, and then it pulls open the top layer. So it's not unstable. And we decided to leave the cracks by and large. You know, there were retouches in other areas where there were more losses, like right there, toe scuff, that fixed that. You know, other right there, tone that down here, up here, where the toe hits. But otherwise, those were just cleaned and left to be the way they were. They, they were in pretty good condition. I'll end here so Michelle can talk about everything painted on paintings. But one thing I, I wanted to say, and I've been thinking about it lately, is, you know, since COVID and, and everyone's being, having more mindful living, I think Maud had mindful living back then. And this, thinking about all that I learned about her back then and now looking at it now, all these years, she did work that she cared about. She connected with people. She cared about nature. She held on to happy times in her mind during the time when she lived with her mom and dad and her brother. Those were more secure times than her years as an adult. We all know her life as an adult went downhill, you know, in some ways, really. She, she was living a, a less quality of life. But Maud wasn't looking for happiness. She had this wisdom, I'm convinced. She knew that you're not going to find happiness going and looking for it. That's when you won't find it. And you find it, and if you do find it, it has a pretty short shelf life, that kind of happiness. I, I, I can't help but look back on it now, you know, at this, I'm older, and looking, thinking, I think she knew. I think she knew that she found a way to have good mental health by doing all of this, and she found a way to make the happiness last. And there, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. That was Jennifer Fotheringham and all of those wonderful details that we don't know about when we look at the house when it's restored state. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Our final speaker today is Michelle Gallinger. She's uh, going to be talking to us about the many Maud Lewis paintings that Maud sold as part of her commercial practice and the problems and issues that have emerged <laughs> over time with those. Michelle is a fine arts conservator specializing in the treatment of paintings and painted objects. A graduate of the Masters of Art Conservation from Queen's University, Michelle was accredited by the Canadian Association of Professional Conservators in 2008. And for more than 20 years, Michelle has worked on collections of all sizes for both institutions and private collectors in Nova Scotia. She's carried out restoration work on numerous historic buildings 
uh, interiors, such as a recent project to reclaim the Ozias Leduc murals at St. Ninian's Cathedral in Antigonish, which you haven't seen, are beautifully restored. And in addition to her larger projects, Michelle has treated a not insignificant number of pieces by Maude Lewis, uh, along with artwork by other local artists. So please welcome Michelle Gallinger. Talk about the bread and butter. <laughs> Um, I've uh, titled my talk, Bread and Butter. Um, Maud's paintings on board were just that. As a reputation spread, um, their sale provided Maud and her husband with a modest um, but steady income. Uh, shortly after um, I moved to Nova Scotia almost 24 years ago, I began to realize that the conservation of Maud Lewis's paintings were to become my bread and butter too. There are many reasons, there's three basic reasons why, or a combination of, of why a Maude Lewis would come into my studio. Generally speaking, their problems stem from three things. There are the materials that she used, the aging of the materials, and what I call outside interference. Maude used any paint she could get her hands on. Um, as uh, Jennifer was referring to, she didn't have a lot of money, and so um, you will find on her paintings enamels, oil paint, house paint, markers, laundry markers, um, and a number of other stuff at times. Um, so basically multimedia paints, things that don't mix together. These have led to a number of problems such as reticulation of paint um, and what Jennifer was referring to on the stairs, alligator. Um, if you look directly at the cow here, you can see that the paint is actually pulling away from the layer below. Next we have bleeding where um, there was paints that she used that were sensitive to moisture in particular. Um, sometimes marker, just sometimes paint that didn't have the ability to stick to oil paint, as on the feet. Um, another one that happens often is, is that she used paints that didn't have enough binders in them, um, and that's created a flaking or powdery paint. Um, and you can see on these lovely, lovely oxen, they're actually in the show, so go see them. Um, they were, the brown on the bodies was completely flaking off, it was consolidated and then in-painted. One of the other areas where we have a lot of problems is because she used different types of paints underneath and also Everett primed a lot of her boards, had a lot of poor adhesion between the layers on the underneath and the ones on top so that if they got any kind of mechanical damage, they would end up flaking off as this poor set of oxen legs have. And I'd like to show you that it, they do come back. So it touched up. Um, another thing that Maud did often was, especially in later years, she thinned her paints down a lot. And I think it was in part um, due to the fact that, that the thicker paints were harder to paint with. But she did thin down to the point of where they were almost non-existent. And lastly, one of her things that she had happen often to her paintings in later years was she used paints that were not light fast, so markers that, and if you can see it, there is her signature that is basically non-existent signature. Um, and one more thing that I will talk about, but it's at the end because I had my slides together before I finished, um, is paint transfer. So. Um, Maud sold most of her paintings when they were barely dry, so often you get a lot of transfer from one painting to another. The second issue of Maud's paintings has to do with um, environmental issues. Um, keep in mind that her paintings are over 50 years old, or the youngest ones. Um, some of them are up to 80 years old. So we have a lot of things that happen that are called, like, particularly to do with light fading. So if you look on the side of this one painting, you will see this nice bright pink line. Um, and that was actually underneath the frame. And so the rest of the building's um, color faded due to UV. And in this one, um, normally I would not ever paint something out that that we have no colors for, but we actually knew what color that was because of that tiny little strip. So I just wanted to show that it, uh, the change in the painting. 
Um, the next thing that we see a lot um, that comes from aging is um, cracking of the paints. Um, there's linear cracks you can see on the poor oxen and that's due to changes in the board and the paint and they're moving at a different rate. One of the most common things I see um, that has to do with environment is accretions on paintings. Um, this one I'm going to be kind to you and just show you um, food on the bottom part of the tree. But one of the more common things that I get to see is bug specks or um, poop all over paintings. Um, and they actually eat through her paint layer. Again, 50 plus years of age, most people don't notice when they first look at a painting and see the painting on the left hand side, oh, it doesn't look that dirty, but they are. And another example of it just to show you how much difference a little bit of cleaning can do. So one of the things that you do get to see, which is hopefully not people don't do as much often, tobacco. So this is probably the best example I've ever had of tobacco dirt in my life. I thought it was varnish and then I go to clean it and it was all tobacco. So as you can see, the <laughs> horse in the background is quite a dramatic change. So the third thing that um, we have in terms of um, Maude Lewis's paintings um, come from the fact that they are mishandled and um, mistreated. In the early years, Everett frequently varnished his paintings, her paintings, um, and um, I'm going to show two examples. Um, this is called outside interference is the other word I used for it. So um, after Maude had finished his paintings, he put this varnish on far too early, and so it actually became part of the white enamel paint, particularly on the fence, you can see, and on these cute little chickadees and uh, chicks and their flowers. And unfortunately, those things are almost permanent and are very, very difficult to remove. So also due to the initial low price of her paintings when she was alive, um, Maude's paintings just often weren't treated with respect. Um, her, and the, and again, when I said about a combination of things, um, Maud used beaver board as her main painting material. She really loved it, whether it was because it was inexpensive or she just liked the texture of it. I, I don't know the answer to that, but um, they have a lot of problems because they were not designed to be used for a painting medium or um, base support. So they have a lot of acidity issues that happen, but the main problem is delamination of the paper pulp. So beaver board is basically made with um, a combination of wood pulp and an adhesive, and then it's um, compressed to the point that it makes the board. So the, the main thing that I get in um, are cracks and damages to corners. So um, delamination of the board, so you can see in this photograph the three corners of it before it was done, during with the infill, and after with the in-painting. And another very good example of it. Um, like I said, this is the, the most common thing that comes in with her boards, the supports, is the lock of corners. The also, the other thing I get that comes with them is dents. And so if you look at this one, you can see just below the loss of corner, of course, is this lovely dent in the painting um, where they've been bent and folded for however they were stored. Another very common thing is to have nail holes as a hanging method, um, tacks, holes, punctures of any form. This one has three there, but I think totally the painting had about 15 of them in it. Um, again, when I was talking about um, issues with the paint layer, scratches are very, very common and through all sorts of layers. They were just tossed in drawers, whatever. Um, so I just like to sh show how much paint can be lost and this is the regaining of the paint. So the lack of framing or poor framing methods um, have caused a lot of damage to paintings. Um, and this is a very good example of 
um, a painting that will come into the studio where the beaver board um, did not have a normal framing system and so um, was also introduced to a lot of moisture and water issues and so the boards are very, very warped. These are probably the biggest struggle to deal with in terms of Maud's paintings. Um, unfortunately, just like us, um, when we get a crick in our back or eh, just damage ourselves, it takes a lot of effort to go back to something that it knows. So um, I actually work with um, another conservator, uh, Julia Landry, a paper conservator, and she has to put them into the press for sometimes months. They have to go be humidified, to be flattened, to put in a press, and then come back out, and they will still pop back up and go in again because they just have a memory to be curved. The other area where we end up with this problem is um, sometimes inadequate framing. So um, the piece on the, the photograph to the left is the one that you just saw. Um, we sort of had to crop the image so you can't see how bad the curve is on there, but the one on the right is um, of a painting that had been framed um, using fishing wire so that you could allow to see the whole painting. The boards are very, very delicate boards. They don't handle um, changes in temperature and humidity, and they are very soft. And so, unfortunately, those fishing wires that were used to hang them cause bow bowing. And so you can see it actually in the shadow beside um, the choo-choo train um, that there is this shadow of a curve, and the piece is actually bowing out of its frame. Again, a nice example of framing materials. Um, so this is... Um, a kind of hanger that was often used, which would be tape, and um, they have a little hook in them. They tend to um, tear the paper off of the back of the painting, so you end up in the center with an area missing a lot of its backing paper. And you guys are going to love these ones. So, I am... So they cause delamination. So this is, these, are, these are my favorite, actually. These, um, Shannon kindly pulled off of the CBC article. So this is Everett about to show cutting a board for Maud. So there he is with his board, and there he is with his sawhorse, and there he is cutting an edge. <laughs> so um, you can see it's all very um, structured and um, particular. So yeah, Everett um, tended to be a little bit crude on his cutting of her boards. Um, so. Um, they're not exactly what I'd call square. I don't think he had a square. Um, and he used just an ordinary handsaw. So um, a lot of his paintings, um, the paintings that Maude did, especially on the beaver board, aren't square. And so we end up with a lot of paintings that come in that have had um, their edges modified to allow for them to fit into a frame or somebody else tried to cut it. So here's a good example of the missing part of a painting where it was trimmed and trimmed very badly to go into a frame. And so you can see on the one side is it before the fill and after a fill. And then this is a, just a detail of that area of us filling it in. Now the painting should have been much bigger than what we actually filled in, but it's a problem, you just can only put in enough to indicate what the size of the painting was and not go overboard. Um, my favorite Maud Lewis of all time to have to deal with. So um, another interesting framing method, so you can see the corner's been cut off of this painting. Um, somebody decided that they were going to frame it with electrical tape and create very interesting corners. So here you go. <laughs> this is what it came to me after I'd taken the electrical tape off. Well, actually, the owner took the electrical tape off. So we have four full corners missing of a Maud Lewis. And this is after corners have been replaced. Um, so that is a, one that for the books. That I, I had never had one quite like that. Um, Another area that I get a lot of in is um, paintings where they have not removed the painting from the frame when they decide to repaint the frame. So all of those lovely little um, black marks around the edge, those are all from when it was framed. Um, varnish. Um, not too many of Maude Lewis's paintings were actually varnished in the past, but she did use, a, um, a, as I said, multimedia. 
Um, she used flat paints, she used gloss paints, she had favorite paints. Um, so I think at, at a certain point, there were people who were trying to varnish them to sort of get all the colors to sort of mix in together. But unfortunately, most varnishes um, aren't a good choice for her paintings because of the multimedia. So they did actually smear um, her paints a bit. Um, and I am going on to probably what's now, unfortunately, um, something that I'm facing a lot more of, which is poor restoration attempts. So since mods have become so popular, people have tried to clean them. And people who don't have or hasn't, haven't spent the time to get to understand the materials or do the testing. Um, and these have led to um, some serious damage. Um, here's an example, it might be a little bit hard for you to see, but um, there's black specks all over the red of the car and there is cotton swabs stuck in the paint layer. Um, another cleaning attempt where they first cleaned it, then put a varnish over it, and when they put the varnish over it, they then smeared all the black paint. So you can see it here, this is me cleaning and you can see they smeared her signature, and this is the smear. They are reversed, sorry about that. Normally it's the other way around. Um, and um, finally, the one of Maud Lewis, um, where somebody tried to clean it and they smeared her signature. And after, I've had to clean all around it because her paint is sensitive to moisture. So, my work with Maud's paintings has had a profound effect on me, just like the other conservators talk about it. Um, it's been immensely satisfying to see her work um, move to the forefront in the Canadian art market. Um, even after working on so many of her paintings, she still manages and is capable of throwing me for a loop. Um, I get paintings in that materials that I still haven't had, um, and. I've done a lot of Maude Lewis paintings. Um, so um, I look forward to continuing to work on her pieces um, so that they just show the full display of her spectrum of color, her love of life, her talent, and her imagination um, for her collectors. And I'm showing this one because, well, number one, I just love the car, but also, right, oops, wrong way. Um, the, this lovely little smear here we could not reincorporate, it's actually a little um, part of the radiator cap, we couldn't reincorporate it into the painting, so we actually had to tone it out because it was so badly <laughs> smeared on this painting. So would I do that now? I'm not sure, but I think that it looks better than the smear. So that was the one from the beginning. So um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I really appreciate um, having people here and listening to what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. We're going to take a few questions, and then if you have a moment, we're going to finish up with a time lapse of the house being moved from the original hangar in Waverly, and then from Sunnyside into the gallery. And now the time lapse footage that we have of the Waverly move is thanks to one of Craig's amazing techs, uh, Todd Vassilo, who took it upon himself to make this recording, killed his camera doing it because time lapse in the mid 90s was not fabulous. Um, and then we incorporated some footage from the CBC that, um, so if you have time after the Q&A, uh, there's no sound, it's just about 12 minutes of large pieces of the house being moved around. It's great. So if anyone in the audience has a question, please raise your hand. And we've got some people wandering around with microphones as well. While we wait, Craig, I know one of my favorite stories is when you were taking apart the house. What did you find in the walls? You have to turn your mic on. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. She did say, wait a second. That was my <laughs> fault. 
I think what you're referring to was uh, we were, before we started disassembling it, and I showed that picture up on the second floor where there was the cot and everything. Um, it was a kind of a jumble, it was old rope and whatever like that. And I happened to look over inside the walls, because the walls weren't finished the way they would be in your home or something with plaster or whatever, you know, it was, it was pretty rudimentary. And I guess it was where the cot or wherever the bed was that, that Everett was sleeping in. Beside it, when you look down here, where it's a collection of old razor blades that I guess that when he finished with them, he would just drop them down the side and the inside of them. There were scads of these things inside of there. I don't know if he thought he was going to get to use them again or whether it was more like my grandfather when he finished with a toothpick. It would just kind of go there and then... You know, he would expect that somebody else would clean it up, but it was, it was a bit of a shock. I was not expecting to find, you know, half of the Gillette company in there. So, so yeah, I hope that's what you meant. That's exactly that's what I was meaning. A really good example of why anyone who works with collections has their tetanus shot up to date. Always, <laughs> always surprises. It's lots of fun. All right. Do we have any? Oh, I see. Yeah. So what's your question? So the question is, how can you tell if a painting is a transfer? Yeah. Oh, a decal. You, you're talking about on the wallpaper, there was a decal. Um, Jennifer? No. no, no are, are you mean a transfer where the, it's transferred oh, yeah. onto something? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, what I was referring to is, is that when Maude um, painted her paintings, like I, I know there, I had a wonderful story somebody had told me about having bought two Maude paintings and they had to put them on the back um, window of their car and to not slide around because they were still wet when they, when they went out. Well, with on, the, on the Model T, the top part of the radiator there, that was smeared because the paint was young and somebody put their finger on it and the paint got smeared before it even left the, or when they took it home. And it's been like that for 50 years, which has really cracked me up for 60 years. So that's actually just an issue of her paintings were going out the door as fast as she was painting them. Did, I, is that not what you were looking for? Oh, I see. Oh, you want to know about those silk screens. Oh, yeah. So, those, so the silk screens. So those come along. Um, yeah, the, the, the easiest way to deal with most of those, there's, there are a number of, of silk screens out there, both ones that were done during her lifetime and ones that were done in the 80s. And there's some that are being done today. Um, but um, the best thing to do is to take it or call one of, like a conservator, but there's actually, um, he'll probably kill me for it, but he's in Portugal right now. <laughs> so Alan Deacon um, is um, a collector and, um, of Maude Lewis and he does most of the, um, unless, you're, unless you're looking for an, an evaluation in terms of how much a painting is worth, um, he does most Maude Lewis's if you send him actually an email or um, he, will, he will tell you whether it's a real one or not. Um, he's the best choice because He's just wonderful. He is um, so enthusiastic and um, caring about Maud's painting. So he would be the one who I would always choose to ask about whether you think you have a real Maud Lewis or not. No, I don't Yeah, so that's a silk screen. So what they do is, is they actually use a piece of silk and they push ink through it onto the surface. Yes, they did. He did do a variety of them. Um, he actually, um, and his name's gone. Escape. Bill Ferguson. Sorry. Bill Ferguson. Yes. So Bill Ferguson um, did a number of silk screens that during the 70s, or sorry, the 60s, early, late 60s, early 70s of Maud's on a, on a form of beaver board. Um, they are slightly thicker than her original paintings though. Um, but yes, those are the ones that, that were done by him. And he actually had um, a contract with her at the time. There's someone in the back, can you raise your hand? 
I, I, I think uh, it's answered, except that I can't remember, I couldn't hear who, who the person's name is that you would go to to find out whether it's an authentic uh, piece. There's um, Alan, Alan is, Deacon. He's, Alan Deacon. He works okay. um, on his own as an authenticator, also um, Zwicker's Gallery locally. Um, often Ian and Alan will collaborate and have a oh. discussion about if they think it's an authentic mod. Okay. Michelle is often part of those discussions when it comes yeah. to the materials. I leave that to Alan and to um, Ian. I do, do, um, uh, I do often be called in for authentication, but it's, um, they're just, um, they have a lot more years of um, experience with um, the imagery, so we talk about materials when they decide that they want to talk to me about that, but that's, that's a separate thing. All right, I saw a gentleman there. Sorry, did they ever? No. So the house that uh, and that Maude and Everett lived in, he actually purchased from somebody else, and then has the story of how many oxen it took to move him onto the property he bought adjacent to the poorhouse. So there's a lot of. As, as Craig has said, there's a lot of very interesting architectural elements. Yeah. It certainly wasn't built to Everett's scale. Uh, the person who first built it was quite a bit shorter. I'm comfortable in it. Everett had to stoop. Uh, so, yes. Yeah, I, that's, that's the one thing that, I don't know, because you can't actually get into the house and the gallery, which, it, which is probably a good thing, but if you were walking around in there, you can't stand up. And I can never figure out when I watch the old uh, CBC movies and, you know, the NFB things, how it is that he's standing up, because he must have been under six feet tall. I'm just not even barely six feet, and I have to bend over because the ceiling was so low. It was great for Maud, but... It is really low in there. I mean, it's, it's built more for like children. It's, 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 it's a tiny little house, yeah. All right, we've run a little long, so I'm going to ask for one more question. And I see you right there. Sir, there's a mic, just. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I remember I, I first saw the house last year, May. In fact, I, even, I did a video recording on my phone and I kept wondering if, and this, my question is to the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. Has there been a, a thought or a suggestion or a proposal to, to move it around? Say for instance, if, um, if a proposal to make it a traveling exhibition. So this does get floated by me every so often and I basically stomp my feet and say no. Um, <laughs> And, oh, and, and if you stick around and watch the time lapse of okay. them moving and reconstructing the house, and, and Craig and I were having these discussions, even just what it would be involved to move it from the current location to a new waterfront gallery, and you have to remove everything in the house. You have to, the, they did do the wallpaper so you can remove it on boards, but you have the plaster that has to be removed because it probably wouldn't last the trip. Yeah. Um, you have it, to get it out of the, the building, which it was built around, so um, it's, yeah, sure. there's walls that need to come out. Um, so it's, it's um, I, I did have a delightful question as to whether we'd have the house here today. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't, actually. <laughs> yeah. It, it would just say it would be incredibly destructive to the house because it was hard enough just doing it once. I was thinking you could build a replica and move it around perhaps, but even then when you think about how big it is, where would you show it that you, like you said, the only reason we got it into the gallery because there was no front on the building when we went in and out, and then they put the doors on afterwards, so we would have to tear the, you know, the art gallery apart just to get out. No, and, and you know, a replica would show most of the same things if you're gonna to tour it, because touring things is incredibly hard on what, what you're sending around too, because it, they get looked at or handled or there's the ex expectation they're gonna be able to go inside or, you know, it's, it's, it's quite complex. So, uh, we, so I would we, say no too, to, to the original anyway. <laughs> to After the original, that, it's up to her. But, we've yeah. uh, occasionally had discussions about working with some of our film industry folks about doing a, something that could travel a, in a more versatile fashion, but it's still a huge, it's a small house, but it's a lot of material to it's move. It's a lot of work. So, yeah. 
All right, thank you very All much. Right. I mean, your talk today answered, um, answers my, what I was thinking. I was just imagining, okay, how was this brought here and how was it coupled and everything? Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Well, thank you, everybody. And I think we'll start the time lapse so you yeah. can enjoy that. But before we go, I just want to thank you all for coming again. A reminder that the McMichael Maud Lewis exhibition is on until April 23rd, but the house is around permanently. Um, so please come and visit. Uh, we have the new audio tour and we have various mod programming. Uh, check our website. We do have a filming of the film Maudi coming up on April 15th uh, at the Art Gallery. And I think that's about it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig, Michelle, Jennifer. And Lori. <laughs>